What's up, everybody? Before we hop into this juicy podcast, I wanted to talk to you about Cardomax. Go over to Cardomax.com and check out their full supplement lineup from energy intensifier, hydration packs, recovery accelerants. They have everything to make sure that you are supported full spectrum from before your workout all the way through when you're ready to go to bed. So go check them out over at Cardomax.com. Use the code ones ready at checkout. The energy intensifier is a favorite of Trent. You always turn around and see Trent opening one of the patented little packets and throwing that into his water before just about anything. It might not be a workout. He uses pre-workout before meetings because he just loves to get after it. My favorite is the immune booster. I love that uh, the vitamin C and immune supplement stack that they've got working there. So I just throw it in my water if I'm feeling the sniffles, if I feel like I've had a, a rough day of travel, or if I'm just worn down from training, I throw one of these in my morning shake. It's perfect. It's fantastic. So we're going to get on to this new podcast with the FTU TACP leadership. Uh, but go over to cardomax.com right now and make sure to use code ones ready at checkout on the podcast. <laughs> this is the this is the magic of podcasting. Welcome back, everybody, to the One Thirty Team Room. In our TACP series of the FTU, we went all the way to the top. We've got the leadership from the FTU, and uh, you know, Nick, the SEL. Congratulations, welcome to the podcast. You're going to have to repeat yourself for the first time <laughs> in podcast history. So, welcome, welcome to the team room. And I'm sorry for being slow on the record button. So, uh, once again, TACP FTU leadership, SEL, Nick. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. And of course, he drops off. <laughs> this been, of course this has been it he's, he's back but you know J justin jp we're gonna start with you man why don't you tell us you know who you are and, and what you do for for the tech pf to you uh yeah thanks so my name's justin uh i'm the opera <laughs> <laughs> this is the yeah. best yeah nick we got you this is the yeah. best intro of all time when you uh when you dropped off i asked jp to start so uh he's there <laughs> we're, we're gonna go from there we're not editing any of this by the way this is all absolute <laughs> excellent gold. and your video works now which is great look at this it's nice. it's all Upgrade. better everything works so <laughs> jp take it away <laughs> yeah so uh, my name is justin uh, i'm the operations superintendent at the six cts uh so i work uh one rung below uh nick there um i've been a uh, tag for about 15 years uh, i'm coming back uh from the afsoc side i guess uh, I was up at Fort Lewis for a long time, uh, deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq and all that stuff while I was there. Uh, I was at Webber School with uh, Nick and Peaches, uh, went to AFSOC, and now I'm, I'm back here uh, with the FTU. Nice, nice. And then you're the operations superintendent out there, so you're obviously mm -hmm. in charge for everybody that doesn't know. You know, when, in ST, we typically call it the top four, right? So you have your chief and your op soup on the enlisted side. You've got your commander and your DO on the officer side. That's typically how uh, that's typically how we point these big ships that we call squadrons to get after stuff. So you found yourself working at the FTU, you know, after a couple deployments and stuff. I know that for me, being an instructor, um, you know, it wasn't my lifelong calling. Obviously, that was, you know, being a PJ and, and doing this, mm -hmm. this aspect war thing on the PJ side of the house. But there is a certain draw to being an instructor. Did you feel that draw before you went to the FTU or was, you know, were you tapped mm -hmm. to go to the FTU? Uh, well, I did. It was a ad you had to volunteer for and, and do an interview and stuff. So um, it was a choice. I mean, I wanted to come back. I was an instructor at the, the weapon school for three years. So, um, right. And I've been a JTAC guy, JTAC instructor for I don't know how long. So uh, you're always teaching, you're always mentoring people. Your your job is NCO in general, right? You're always teaching. Um, I was excited though. I did I did want to go back, um, especially being a TAC P, uh, leaving AFSOC. It was kind of like going home, you know. I'm I'm going back to to the community that uh, that is my community, right? Uh, and it was it is exciting to to work with the uh, the next batch of guys and uh, even the instructors there. I mean, obviously you guys had Lucky and Breen on. I knew Breen in Washington. Uh, Lucky's awesome, and and so just uh, working with those guys is a lot of fun too. Yeah, outstanding. We got we got Peaches back, we got Nick back. I don't know if anybody can talk right now, but this has been. I will tell you, technically, <laughs> it's been the most challenging. You know what I mean, Peaches? Do you have audio? Are you? He doesn't, and it's so cute. It's great, Nick. I see. Uh, I see you're back now. You want to? Uh, you want to hit us off as the SEL the FTU TAC P or the TAC P FTU? Uh, can you tell us basically? You know. How it is that you found yourself there? A little bit about your back. Yeah, yeah. first thing first, and apologies for cutting out. The internet sucks where I'm at. But um, can you hear me? Just want to make sure I'm loud and clear. Hey, brother. So uh, I got cut off when I was uh, saying hello. But real quick, just want to rewind. Want to thank uh, One's Ready, you, Trent, Peach, for what you do, brother. You give the uh, Aspect War community a voice. Uh, thank you for uh, talking to key leaders, decision makers uh, within our community, and letting uh, those who want to come into the community 
uh, you know, be informed with, with what to expect uh, moving forward as we're evolving uh, to the future. Uh, with that said, my name is Nick Corona. I'm the uh, Senior Enlisted Leader for the 6th Combat Training Squadron here at Nellis. Uh, a little bit by myself. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how long, but been over 20 years. Been there for 20 years. Uh, I'm, I'm probably that guy who's still around who can uh, speak to what Afghanistan was like back in 2003. So that lets you know a little bit about how long I've been in. Um, been at the 6th UTS for about a year and, and really excited. Uh, training has been uh, probably about 10 years of my experience in the Air Force. So uh, very happy to be here and lead the uh, the Gators moving forward. Yeah, that's fantastic. How much has training changed over that time? I mean, I I also uh, would prefer not to talk about how long I've been in because then, <laughs> you know, my timeline, like you guys have actually done cool stuff. People look at my timeline and they're like, wow, that's a that's a whole lot of nothing packed into a long, long career. So I like to try <laughs> to keep the timeline short. Um, you know, how much has training changed just to, just with you guys in the six CTS out in, out, uh, you know, out in Nellis and running the FTU. That is a huge change from where we used to be even, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. So, Nick, from from your optic here, how much has training evolved since you've been in? Yeah. So I'll tell you, brother, um, you know. You know, I'm not sure how much uh, background you know about TACP, but, you know, most of our career field works with uh, conventional Army. So, for example, 82nd Airborne Division, 101st, uh, 10th Mountain, you name it. Um, so a lot of our training, you know, is was mostly uh, you come in the Air Force back in the day when I came in and then you go straight to your technical training, which is uh, our three level course. And then, uh, you know, back in the day, I'm not going to tell you when I when I went through, but um, it was it was roughly about five to five months ish. And then from there, you would move to your uh, your first air support operations squadron and uh, get the five skill level that, uh, training that you need to move forward to deploy. So around that time, you know, I'm not sure how long you did, Aaron, but uh, that's when GWAT, you know, kicked off. We, it was it was young. That's the global war and uh, terrorism. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, go learn how to do your soldiering skills. Go uh, shoot, move and communicate as fast as you can so we can get you out the door out to Afghanistan. So training was fast, furious. And I'll be honest. Um, from my experience, I'll just say for myself, a lot of what I learned in TACP and in how to shoot, move, and communicate, a lot of it was on the job training while deployed. And, uh, you know, today um, deployments have, you know, slowed down a little bit uh, for the TACP community. Um, and what it, what's, what it helped us do is, is fine tune our craft uh, and, and build this FTU, this formal training that we have now to, uh, you know, fine tune and, and go against the, the future threat, whatever that may be. So, uh, in my opinion, training has, uh, in, in advancedly, advancedly uh, increased. Um, you know, Justin uh, came in a little bit later than I did, so he, I'm sure he can tell you it's changed a lot since he came in. I think he's been a little over 10 years. And then um, the technology, man, it's advanced. Um, the, the resource that we've been given, the human performance aspect has changed greatly. Um, you know, we're, we're investing in our people more, uh, not only in, in the physical aspect, but the cognitive aspect. You know, we're, we're getting individuals that are a little more uh, – advanced in education coming in. So that's a huge bonus when it comes to uh, innovation and technology. So, man, I'm, I'm still excited, you know, being here and, and seeing this change and uh, watch it as it progresses. Yeah. And, and Justin, I, I do want to turn it over to you because, you know, I came in, you know, I went through a, a regular Air Force technical training pipeline. I, I was a phys tech and then I made my cross training and, you know, started my pipeline journey, you know, 2005 or, or whatever it was. But, you know, I had the benefit of seeing you know, the early parts of the pipeline and how the instructors were instructing the early parts of GWAT. And then fast forward for me, you know, 10 years later, I went back to that schoolhouse and we were, we had a completely different plan. We were not even talking about the same things mm -hmm. that I got trained with. Was that your experience too, as a, as a young TACP airman? Uh, not quite. I mean, cause a lot of the stuff is, is, uh, I don't want to say universal, but, uh, it's timeless in a way, right? Like, like, uh, senior was saying like shoot, move, communicate, right? Like battle drill one hasn't changed in a thousand years. So, you're still going to sure. train to that level. The the building blocks are all uh, not going away, right? It's still the same stuff. What has changed is is the way that we get to the end point, and especially on the, the JTAG training side. Um, like he mentioned, like Iraq and Afghanistan, where you went there to train, right? Like it was part of your your development. Was you'd finish tech school, um, you you maybe knew what you were doing, you were enough to be dangerous, right? And then you'd go on a deployment, and that's when you like finally figured out how you, how to do your job. Um, Right. It was almost like a stepping stone. Like you had to do your, your Romad deployment, uh, which I know Breen was talking about. Then you could go to JTAC UC. Then you could maybe deploy as a JTAC, right? Like, so this was almost just built into the way we did things. On the formal training side, um, there's been a lot of changes. When I went through, it was in Florida, you know, back when it was hard. Uh, and now it's in right, uh, Texas. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Now it's in Texas with the, the phase one guys you talk to and Chris and those guys out there. But a lot of the skills are – I don't think they are. They took really anything out other than like old, outdated radios we don't use anymore. But all they've done right. is add, uh, made, made it harder, longer, uh, taught more skills that you need to know before you're in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, not figure out why you're right. there. Um, so they've only improved it, I would say, is what I'm getting at. Right. And, you know, I, I definitely feel that going on my first team member rotation where I was a medic. It was 100% training. It was get you mm-hmm. getting that initial training that you could get just the the least amount, not the least amount, but the what is the the minimum amount that we need to get you trained up before you can go deploy. Yeah. I, I think we all felt that pain, especially during that time in the ops tempo. Um, I want to kind of switch gears to to the overarching look, right? Like we got down and down and dirty into phase one and phase two. And, you know, senior, I want to turn it over to you. You know, at your phase, you're really putting eyes on what you guys think should be a finished product. Once they get out of that FTU, you know, I, I have a sense that you're putting a stamp on them like, hey, they have gotten our best shot and they are ready to go out there and do good things for the taxi community. Like from a, a 30,000 foot view for the FTU, you know, senior, what do you want to see out of those students as they're graduating and they're leaving your spaces out in Vegas? Well, I'll tell you what, Aaron. Um I've been getting here. So since I've been here at the six for about a year, you know, we've had the opportunity of, of, um, you know, talking to commanders at the ASOS and, and that's a question that we, we asked them exactly, you know, what, what is the product that you're getting? Are you happy with what you got at the ASOS is, um, is there improvements and in, in feedback you have for us? And I tell you right now that what I'm getting from, you know, the leadership's getting from commanders at their operational units is the FTU is exceeding the standard. Um, they're, they are happy with, uh, you know, the academic uh, training that they're getting, the physical training that they're getting. Um, students are coming in with, uh, you know, arriving to ASOS, um, you know, having to learn the vignettes for the last 20 years with GWAT. Uh, they're coming more advanced uh, technical savvy, uh, better critical thinkers and decision makers. They're, they're individuals that could, um, you know, like all ASPORC wants, is individuals that can work in the gray, uh, think outside the box, take initiative. And then show up, uh, you know, first day at the operational units as, as leaders and have that mindset and confidence. So definitely uh, walking out the door, that's that's one of our big uh, goals is have them leave here better than when they got here. And that training starts at development before they hit basic training, right? And it keeps evolving through basic, through, uh, through preparatory course, all the way through the three level. And then day one when they uh, hit Chris Garcia and his team over at phase one and at Camp Bullis. But, uh, man, these guys are coming a lot smarter, a lot sharper critical thinkers, innovators, and then hungry for more. And then the problem that we're having is feeding them opportunity. There's 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 not enough to go around, and, and that's what we're searching for, is giving them more and more opportunity to go excel and, and be the best uh, tack B aspect more airmen that they could be. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, brother, um, exceeding the standards what I'm getting for the operational units. So that, that's happy to hear from my end, but obviously there's always room for improvement. Always. Yeah. And if we're not looking at our own processes and really pulling them apart and, and figuring out where we're weak, you're never going to have that gold standard, that gold standard program. You have to be looking for those areas to get better. And I'm glad that you did bring this up. We've answered it a couple times, right? Like things are slowing down. I, I, I keep hearing, although my ops tempo is going nowhere, people keep telling me things yeah. are slowing down and, you know, sitting up here at the two, two, um, you know, yeah. JP, you're obviously an alum of, of the Pacific Northwest up here, but uh, it ain't mm-hmm. slowing down that much, but we do keep hearing it, right? And we've talked about it a couple times. And, and usually what we say after talking to our friends is, you know, <clears> listen, <throat> there, there's not three theaters of DTAC environment going on right now. There's not, you know, Afghanistan and 10 locations and, you know, 10 locations in Iraq like it used to be in that 2003 to, you know, really 2020 time period. So, you know, JP, how are, how are you talking to the students? And, and more importantly, what mission sets are you guys looking at? We can't fight the last 10 years war, right? Like, Right. Go into a compound, cordon, call out, and calling in a 500 pounder. Like those days are over. Like we're not we're not doing that right now, right? Um, we may in the future, sure, but um, we're not doing it right now. There's a next fight that's coming. How are you keeping your students focused on that next fight, even when people are sitting there going, you know, hey, things are slowing down. We don't have as much job, you know, Justin. I'll, I want to hear both your answers because I think it's yeah. important. But Justin, we'll start with you. It's definitely it's definitely tough, and I mean, the only way to do it, and we actually kind of have this little speech when the classes get to us and we're the last five weeks of their pipeline. Right. So they're almost done. Right. Um, yeah, you honestly, right. you just kind of have to be honest. Um, you know, no, you're, you're not going to be out the door to Afghanistan three months after you, you graduate the pipeline. It's that is not happening. Right. Uh, but kind of right. what you're talking about is, well, you're still going to NTC or JRTC or on training evolutions or 
there are other deployments that they're not to get your gun fighting on, but there's still bad people out there. There's still stuff going on. Um, so people are probably away from home just as much as they were. Uh, they're just, oh, yeah. unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you know, they're not in a shooting war. Um, right. so that piece yeah. is certainly, uh, slowed down. That's what, you know, everybody keeps alluding to the problem though. And then I think it is difficult is, is staying ready. Um, you know, there's that, that saying like, uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparation and that, that sort of thing. Like, I don't think the right. guys that invaded Afghanistan on the back of a horse knew where Afghanistan was. <laughs> September 5th to that one. You know what I mean? So what a, that's how the yeah, next one's going to go. <laughs> what a, yeah, what like, a great, oh man, what a great visual to, to kind of explain it. Yeah. The guys <laughs> that were riding around on horses, dropping bombs, probably didn't know what it was going to look like 15 years later either, man. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, and especially Jesus, sorry, uh, <laughs> especially with the, uh, the conventional side of things, you know, TACP is a conventional asset. Like we, 99.9% of the career field is going to be with the, the conventional army. And the conventional army is a sledgehammer, right? So what you're right. staying ready for is that thing to come out and destroy somebody, right? We took Iraq out in four days, right? So uh, the guys got three bronze stars with Valor in four days, right? So uh, that opportunity will come around. If you look at history, right? Barrett goes to war fairly regularly. Uh, and right. so it's staying ready. Your job is to stay ready and be ready for the next one. Uh, so that you can be the guy on a horse or riding a tank or whatever guys are gonna are gonna do next, right? So that's kind of the speech that I have to give. But I fully acknowledge it's hard. I mean, it it's hard. Oh, we we feel the exact same thing. And you know, sometimes you are sitting there and you you almost don't know what to say. You know, for us yeah. for PJs, it's a little bit easier because I can look at a guy and go, you know, you know, it's funny to be on the STS side and you know, have a, a controller, an SR guy be like, what, what do you, what do you mean? You guys just sit here and sort of wait for a mission. We're like, yeah, there's a whole training plan. You don't go out on target every night. Like this is, this is what <laughs> yeah. sitting alert is. And the guys are like, oh, this is terrible. You're telling me this is just like training. It's just, you, you're taking incoming every day. I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. Like, welcome, welcome to a, a standard like CSAR deployment. CSAR right. means come sit and relax for a reason, baby. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but it's, it's hard to, it's hard to describe that to a younger, a younger, cause again, they're almost always righteous. They're mm -hmm. almost always looking at you like, Hey, I want to come in here and I want to do the job and I want to do the job to the best of the ability. And the, the full explanation, the full like realization of that job is getting into a gunfight and saving the day with a bomb. Like, am I going to, you know, get to be able to do that soon? Mm -hmm. And for a long time, that answer was yes. And now that answer yeah. is, listen, maybe, but we need you to do these other things anyway. Um, yeah. Senior, how, how do you phrase or, or frame those sort of things? Like, how do you address the question of, hey, we're slowing down? And, you know, especially for those young studs at, at your at your end, like, again, you're you're it. You're the, you're the clearinghouse. You're the final stamp of approval. So what, what do you say to keep those young airmen motivated? Leave it right. Spot. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Hey, so... Um, you know, I'll just say this. You know, we have a saying in the in the aspect work community and in, in tactically, especially. You know, we have the saying of a continued earn your beret. All right, and there's you guys know this. You, we've been in a long time. You know, most of uh, you know be our time in, in aspect war and uh, you know serving in our specific career fields. Um, Ninety percent of it is is training, right? Getting ready for the next thing, and ten percent mostly is combat, right? So ninety percent we're going back doing training. Um, you know, that's how it was before GWAT kicked off, you know, like Justin said, you know, September 10th and below, you know, nobody knew where Afghanistan was. Uh, they heard about it. They may, they maybe have watched rainbow three and, and got a little essay, you know, what, what was going on in Afghanistan when the Soviets were there. But, uh, here's the thing. I, I don't, I don't want to say it's slowing down, you know, cause that kind of degrades it. But what, what's really going on is the, the, the threat is changing, right? Uh, near peer, uh, threat is, is on the horizon. Um, and then, um, you know, last 20 years, we've been doing um, contingency, you know, coin operations over in Afghanistan and the Middle East. And it, in, in a way, it's just been going out, shoot, move, communicate, calling in airstrikes on, uh, you know, a bunch of bad people running around and not having to go against, uh, you know, high threat, you know, environments, uh, large forces. And really what we're doing is just shifting our training to that. And, and it's always been that, you know, uh, country on country type fighting. And then obviously, you know, uh, in time, things change that kind of put a stop to that. And then now we're getting focused back to it again. Mm -hmm. And what's helping us is uh, technology, lots of lessons learned uh, from the Middle East uh, for our time there. 
And then, uh, you know, getting back after training, it's always been about training and, and training should be the hardest thing you do. So when we do go have to do the combat portion of it, it's easy. We've been exposed and it's hopefully something we've never um, that surprises us that we've seen in training. So, you know, we continue to push our guys here at the FTU and other operational units and all career fields uh, continue to push their people and then train for the things that we're not good at. So th those are the things that we tell our, our FTU guys, our young cats coming up. Um, you know, they, we, we do provide them uh, a lot of lessons learned. We got from uh, GWAT, the ones that are still around. And then uh, we talk about a lot of vignettes of things that we did right, things we didn't do well, and how can we improve them down the road. And then, uh, you know, where I get excited is, at least from my, you know, from my perspective, I'm talking to the future of our career field, you know, the future of our Air Force, um, individuals that want to serve and give back. And these are the ones that are going to win that future war against the new threat, whatever that may be. Man, you're motivating me out here. Careful, dog. We're going to go for two hours. You start talking. Let's like, do it, man. I'm going to start doing push-ups. I'm going to have to do it. No, I, I, I love it. I love it. And I hear I hear a ton of stuff, you know, reflections in there that you're doing the right thing. Like, did we learn from GWAT? Did we learn those lessons? I'm even more interested in how, how closely are you guys staring at the Russia-Ukraine problem? Because we, te we keep talking that we're going to go into this LISCO environment. We've got a LISCO war and a DTAC happening right now in the Ukraine and in you know mm -hmm. East or Western Russia, if you want to look at it, Eastern Ukraine. So how much are you guys staring at that problem? And you know, be honest with me here, Nick. When you see all of these films of all of these heavy armor rolling around, does your does your mouth just water? Like, do you get a tingly in your hands where you start making up nine? I have to imagine that's what it is. Hey, Aaron, so I, I get sad, man, that I'm getting old. I'm, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel going for my career. <laughs> Here's the rank for us. Let me go back and be a, a senior airman, young JTAC, and, and you know, go take care of business. So, absolutely, man, I'm excited for these guys going forward. If it turns into that, in that sense. That's what we came in to do, and that's what we're looking for. Right. But, uh, hey, Justin, man, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for us, uh, looking at the uh, Russia threat, brother. No. So there's – this is actually – I think you feel like you've been sitting in on these conversations that our career field is having, Aaron. Uh, so yes. the – That the, means we have access, baby. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. this, uh, this comes up all the time, right? Uh, there's always – the, the they, the ominous they is always like, you know, you got to go back to Russia or kind of go back to Russia, right? Because it's Cold War. Uh, you got to look at China. Right. You got to look at all these future problems. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, again, depending on how you look at it, like at the at where we're teaching, it's that those basic foundational skills. And we're going to, you know, get higher or harder and, and more into the advanced stuff. But just like I said, Balger 1 hasn't changed. Like doing nine lines on tanks hasn't changed either. And when you're at the level um, that we're working with, it, it kind of doesn't matter is if is the threat uh you know Russian made or, or Chinese made or or whatever. Like I need my guy to plot that on a map and execute the things that he's supposed to do. Uh we're not having high level debates about you know where it came from and everything and everything else. So the scenario is at what was JTEC you see, what is now phase two. Um <clears throat> they've always been primarily that LISCO or MCO, that phrase keeps changing. Uh GPC, all those things, right? So yeah, um, right. they've kind of always been that way. Um, and as we learn things, we, we update what we're doing. We're certainly, that is the, what everybody's looking at, right? Russia, Ukraine, China, all that stuff. Um, that, yes, that's on everybody's mind. At the same time, it's like, I, I need you to show up at the right place at the right time and do the things that I'm telling you to do. Uh, and we can have those debates, uh, the higher level debates later. Um, and then I'm also one of those guys that's, it's important to me that we don't just completely brain dump uh, GWAT stuff. Uh, it was right. like 10 years ago, people started going like, well, you know, coins easy. We got to start looking at this other stuff. And then we did 10 more years of getting it on in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like there's still Whoever guys said, getting it on. Yeah. So like, this is, Whoever this is not over. Really. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> you just go ahead and point them to no country winning a coin engagement in the history right. of the world. Oh, oh, we got this coin thing figured out. No. Do we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. News yeah, to, yeah. That's news to quite uh, a lot of people. I think that's a, uh, yeah. that's a pretty big move. Um, so how have you guys managed that training? And, and again, I'm trying to like bridge the gap, right? Because we get so many questions. We get frustrated when people are like, oh, well, we don't know what we're going to do. And we don't know what environment we're going to work in. And I'm not going to be able to do this. When we look at what you guys are doing, we're like, oh, they're no, they've totally fixed all these questions. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bridge the gap between that brand new person <clears throat> that doesn't know what they don't know, right? And you guys who are literally planning for the next thing. 
because you've used your, I mean, what is it like 60 years between the three of us of, you know, military experience that are sitting on this call right now. Um, You know, there are people in rooms that are looking at problems and we're like, we think this is where we're going to go. And it's hard to articulate that to those young airmen, to those young, Mm -hmm. to those young TACP, um, you know, men and women that really just want to do righteous stuff that really want to get in and go get after it. Um, So that's, that's a big challenge for us. What are, what are some challenges that you guys face at the FTU? Obviously the integration of a new tool is always going to be tough, right? Like you get it, you get a 163, the 163 sucks. I get it. It's too hot, (laughs) whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like whatever I'm supposed to say about all the antennas or whatever, whatever about the 163. But I was saying the same thing about the 152 when they took my 148 gem from me, which is unequivocally (laughs) the world's best radio. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> that's a hot take. <laughs> that's, that's a hot take. World's best radio. 148 gem. Holler at me. Um, and it's the, the world's dumbest take from a PJ. Um, <laughs> what other challenges are you guys seeing with the integration of technology, with you know finding new ways to get after old problems? Um, you know, is, is that changing your battle drill one, like in, including that technology? Or are you guys straight up just like, listen, you can add on whatever technological piece we got later, but we need you to do these basic things here. Yeah. Hey, Aaron, this is uh, Nick, man. I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and kick that off uh, first. So uh, first thing I want to say, man, is is I think the whole DOD is going through the same problem. So like a, a cultural training shift, right? So um, the two domains that, at least in my career, that uh, I've been very familiar with, probably with most people in the DOD, is, is land, and, land and, um, and air, right, operations. The new ones, the new do- domains that we all got to get smart on are uh, what, C? I, mean, I know for the tech, P, definitely C in maritime. Uh, cyber and space are the are the new uh, domains uh, moving forward, and uh, you know a big challenge for us is um, at least in TACP, you know we don't have a lot of people with with vast experiences and knowledge in, in those other three realms. Uh, heavily can talk about land and air, right. but when, when it comes to the other domains, you know a big thing that you know before we can get after teaching students and the inbound uh, airmen, you know that's going to serve uh, us as instructors got to go and, and and get smart ourselves and go get those experiences. And then, uh, you know, what, what's unfortunate is those are experiences aren't uh, open to everybody in the DOD. So we have issues of uh, clearance issues, mm-hmm. money issues, um, the ones that are teaching, you know, stuff about space and cyber. Um, you know, even them, they're, they're trying to learn how they could, uh, you know, provide that kind of data to, um, you know, AFSCs within the Air Force that never had to dabble into that before. So, you know, building new curriculum. Sure. Um, you know, finding out ways of, uh, you know, how to apply that to your to your current career field. That's what's hard for us. All we can do right now, at least in the TACP community, is kind of go off concepts, you know, trusting our leaders at the MAGCOM levels and above. I know in the past you've talked to uh, uh, Chief Macias Craps at half, and he gave you guys a breakdown of TACP strategy moving forward. I know you've talked to uh, 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 Dan Staggs, he goes by Nasty over at Matchcom. He's the uh, weapon tactics guy for us at Tech P. Oh, yeah. And I know uh, Chief Case TC has provided you guys some inputs on a strategy moving forward. And, you know, honestly, nobody really has the answer of what we have to go do. We just have to, um, you know, get the guidance from the Air Force and the DoD itself, understand the threat, and then figure out within our own sphere of influence how we can get after the problem set. You know, and, that, and that's hard to do. I know for us, uh, we're going through uh, tons of innovation oh, yeah. and, and technology changes. And uh, what we've done in the TACP community is, is network and integrate with a lot of uh, agencies in the D- DOD that we haven't done before mainstream. And uh, it's, it's tons of collaboration, integration, and then uh, working together to solve problem sets. And, and as you're tracking, Aaron, you know, TACP and GA getting together, you know, figuring out how we can integrate moving forward uh, on the new battlefield. So that's a, that's a big thing for us, too, making that a thing. And uh, I'm looking forward for that. So, Justin, I don't know if you got anything to add to that, brother. Yeah. No, I think it kind of adds into what I would say you asked about, uh, you know, the challenges there and it's, there's, there's too much stuff. That's, that's the biggest challenge I have. Like as a, uh, let's, if you want to call it running this FTU, there's too much stuff. And at at some point, uh, you know, we'll get feedback from the field of like, well, you guys should be teaching them this, or they should be at this level. And I agree with all of it, but I can't, I don't have time. I don't have money. (laughs) I don't have, I don't have physical space to put them in. Like logistically at some point I have to say, or we have to say like, this course is done. Here is your product. Here's your airman. Right. Here's your problem now, right? And that's those. You're an operational unit. You pick up the training from there. And so it's always uh, it is always a moving target of like what that is. Like when have we when have we done enough to to turn right, this guy right. loose? Uh, and I I don't have the right answer. I think we're doing as as good as we can. But yeah, I would love to add another six months to the pipeline. But you know, I don't have the checkbook to do that. So uh, there we we do what we can, and we're 
governed by rules that I don't get to make or have a say in, you know, I can't teach them something if it's not on this, you know, master plan in the matrix somewhere. Like, so there's just a lot and getting to the point that you feel good of like, I have, I have done my job and I have given my dudes on the the line squadrons, like another guy that, that should be there. Um, Figuring out where that is, is a moving target that we we're doing the best we can. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, I, I feel that pain, brother. When I was, I mean, we, you know, for everybody that doesn't understand, we in AFSPAC war are some of the most flexible, um, able, multi-capable airmen. Like we can see things, you know, we get calls from our friends downrange and this happened. No kidding. As a, as I was an instructor, we would get calls from deployed teams and they'd be like, yo, here's this TTP that, that is getting used out here. You guys should be teaching people how to do this. Even if it's as simple as, you know, Hey, we had a couple, this is no kidding. A real story. Somebody called me and was like, Hey, we got, you know, two of our, two of our security element last night got into a pretty bad gunfight. One of them got pretty hurt because they were going into wadis and they weren't paying attention on the top part as they top popped up over the wadis. So now we've been working battle drills with like correct elevations and correct security when you're doing micro terrain. And all of us are like, wow, that's great input. Okay. But now it takes me eight months to write that change into the training plan to get it approved by AETC or, you know, ACC. And then I have to be approved to teach it. And then it has to be validated and it has to, you know, do all these things and it gets frustrating, but you hit the nail on the head. There's almost too much stuff. When I re basically I was part of the team that rewrote the PJ curriculum down at the schoolhouse and our initial, you know, offering to the career field. And I'll never forget this. I was like, okay, I can do everything you guys say you wanted. I need 198 days worth of a yeah. course and they would laughed me out of their office they were like mm-hmm. absolutely not you get 120 days i was like well yeah but the career field said that they need them to be trained on all of these things and yeah. i had a good friend of mine look at me and go listen sometimes your friends in the career field are stupid and, they don't know that <laughs> and you're here to you're here to guide them to yeah. get them to a place where you know you're not spending 190 days in an apprentice course like that's just too much you can't spend three-fourths of a year in the apprentice course it's not how it goes um from your from your optic, and I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk directly to kind of the attributes of the people that we're seeing because what we love here is we love taking in rumors and disinformation and absolutely <laughs> smashing them, right? We keep hearing that these young men and women are entitled. We keep hearing that they're not as hard as they used to be. We keep hearing that they're not as good as we used to be. I tend to disagree with that fact. I tend to disagree with that mm-hmm. assumption because I get to see these three levels and these five levels that come out of these these programs and come directly to the two series units. But I want to open it up to you and we're Nick, we'll start with you from the old crusty SEL. <laughs> what are you seeing that's good about this new generation that's coming through? Hey, hey brother. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start with this. Um, I, I think every generation talks about the new generation in a, in a negative manner, right? Everybody was better than everybody. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and continue with that and saying, in my opinion, I think this new generation is better than, than, than mine. And, and here's why, man, they're, they're coming in uh, more educated. They're coming in hungry. Um, I'll give anybody a high five and a hug that, that wants to come in and serve our nation. You know, today there's, uh, you know, military has been doing a lot of great things the last 20 years. But, you know, I got kids that are, uh, you know, of age uh, that can come into the military. I got some in college and I got one serving right now in, in, in the TACP community and he wanted to serve. And um, no there, way. Your son, a son, son my oldest son. Yeah, he, he came and asked if war wanted it's to serve. Funny. And, um, how awesome is that? Good. Congratulations for you. Look at the, the pedigree on this family. Holy cow. Let's get no, you, let's, let's get some DNA saved right now. Big Nick. Like we gotta, we might have to keep this going. Oh, man. Man. Yeah, brother. But you know what, what I'm saying, they're, they're coming in better. They're coming in smarter. They're coming in hungry. And, and where I feel bad is, is I, I don't have, um, you know, the opportunities to go and, and, and prove themselves and where I can offer it, at least from my perspective is, you can go prove yourself, serve your country and do it well in training. And then when, you know, when the flag goes up and you're called upon to go use that skill set that we've taught you, you know, we sent you forward with a confidence uh, to go be successful. We sent you forward of how to be a team player and, and, you know, be involved in a team and work together because as you know, we can never do anything alone. And then, you know, number, number three is just go and have fun while you're doing it. And, um, you know, this new generation, I'm, I'm very excited and I, and I take it, you know, very, very seriously when it comes to training, because like I was saying earlier, they are the ones that are going to go lead, uh, you know, to victory, lead our people to victory against the new threat, whatever that is. 
whether it's a uh, near peer or Lisco, whatever you want to call it, they're the ones that are going to, um, you know, do the things that are, you know, that most people can't do. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for this new generation, yeah. you know, and, and like I said, I'll just say it again, reiterate, every generation talks a little bit of crap about the next one. And it's, it's just a thing that continues on. Right. And, and I don't think anybody truly means it. You know, some of the things I tell these guys offline, I go, hey, the, you know, the, the saying is the greatest generation was the ones in World War Two. I don't know if there's a generation that can beat that one, but why don't you strive and, and try to be that generation moving forward? Because you can be. And all it takes is just trying and commitment and discipline moving forward. So I'll just kind of leave it with that. I don't know if uh, Justin has added on to that one. Well, I, I mean, I could go on a huge rant, but I, I won't. Um... Let's just, go. That's yeah. the point, Justin. They need uh, to hear it. Listen, yeah. put on your put on your at least, at least give us a taste. And just taste, tell them, hey. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm a I'm a millennial, right? So I'm like the most hated right. on generation <laughs> ever. Uh despite the what the fact that we're the ones that fought the GWAT. Apparently, we're all a bunch of entitled <laughs> losers, right? Like, yeah, Thanks, we were go. soft, right? Until we were doing six on six my, off. You know, yeah, I'm gonna put my so, skinny jeans on and go cry in my snowflake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Every I've I've never seen a safe space or ran into anybody that was as worried about the things that people spend all day complaining about, right? So I wish everybody right. would just get back to work and turn the TV off personally. But uh, no, absolutely, yeah. they're the same. Uh, my call sign is a joke about me being arrogant, and I got it as an airman. It's the same thing. Like Nick said, it's the same exact crap that everybody says about every other generation. Sometimes it's all in good fun and that's fine. Sometimes it's honestly, it's just an excuse. Like you're just a bad NCO and you're just blaming it on Twitter instead of your inability to mentor and lead people that are younger than you. Like we're different. Everybody's so what? Uh, the entitlement piece isn't a generational thing. It is like you guys have talked on the other couple episodes. Um, it's kind of a problem in all of aspect war. And honestly, I think you probably see it in every community that isn't the army. Uh, because if you, you, obviously the seals, right. The, they have the reputation that they have the, the pipeline dudes that, that we're now making, right. It's, it's a different approach, uh, the way that everyone else makes stuff versus, cause I think it's because we don't have that common, like if you're a green beret or, or a ranger or defo or whatever else, like you started infantry, right? Like you started as mm -hmm. a grunt. Uh, we don't have that. Like you come in and you're superhero from day one. And you got to be right. reminded every once in a while, like you haven't actually done anything. Uh, like Lucky said, like you've never made it, right? None of us have. You never will. Uh, so that is a uh, cultural, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but it's not generational. It's not because they're 20. You know, it's just because that's right. If, if I was in their shoes, I'd be the same way. I probably was the same way, right? So, uh, oh, yeah. I see no, you remember I, yeah. talking you know, to Vietnam era vets and they would yeah. tell you the number one thing they're like, the number one thing that you're going to have to deal with when you go to the army, you're better than them and they know it and they're going to smoke you for it. And we're like, wait a second. We have, a, <laughs> we have an institutionalized, uh, yeah. condescending yeah. attitude towards our army friends and we can't figure out why they smoke <laughs> us when we go to dive school. Like that was happening in Vietnam boys. Like, yeah. I don't yeah. Know, uh, you know what I mean? Like I always, I always tend to giggle at those sort of things. And I, I hear a ton of things that I love coming out of your mouth because I'm a big fan about this ideological shift. Sometimes going backwards is what you need to do in order to go to the future and rebaselining and getting back to that team concept where you're really clipping into your team sergeant. When you show up at the unit, when I was a young man, you showed up and you didn't say anything. You, you were an apprentice. Mm -hmm. You know what an apprentice does? He stares at the master all day long and he tries to figure mm -hmm. out how the master is doing it as good as he's doing it. You clip into that team sergeant, you get in that team training area and you're like, all right, Time to time to get down to business again. So, man, I love hearing what you're saying, and and I tend to agree with you. I don't think it's a I don't think it's an age thing either, or a generational thing either. I think just like you know, just like the senior was saying, man, the night shift always hates right. the day shift. The night shift <laughs> never fills up the water bottles right. They're always leaving their yeah. trash around. They're showing up ten minutes late on turnover. Like we uh the the older crew is always always wary of the younger crew. So. Mm -hmm. At least it's the same on your side of the fence. I, I do want to ask for some good things. What are some some things that the, the new crop of, you know, ANS students, you know, all the way up to, to your end, because you guys are the logical end um, of the pipeline. What are some good things that you're seeing that they're doing that you, you didn't even think of? Have you have you learned anything from watching these young students go through? Uh, Justin, we'll start with you. Uh, 
I don't really watch them. I don't know. No. <laughs> uh, th- <laughs> there's some. Um, I made a comment that that uh, cones yeah. aren't real people, and I feel bad about yeah. that. But that was, I love that you almost said it. You're like, I don't. I don't yeah, watch it's these. Still kind of true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they have nothing to teach me. No. Um, there's um. There's probably a. a and I think it's not necessarily, again, it's not really a generational thing. I think it's just because they're, they're young and hungry and, and they're here to learn things. Right. Um, I have definitely reached a point where I just, I don't want to hear about new stuff. Right. I don't want a new radio. I don't want to change the way I do right. things. I'm going to wear the same plate carrier until I die. Like I'm done changing. They're, <laughs> they're not at that point. Right. Like they're, they're open to learning anything. Hey, here's a new piece of equipment. Here's how it works. Here's a new way you can integrate. Here's how it works. It's all new to them. They want to learn all of it so that, that openness and willingness to uh, learn the things that, because technology is, is getting better, but it's also more complicated and harder to use. It takes more training. So, right. you know, the, their, uh, their willingness to, to learn things and adapt and, and get better is uh, motivational, I guess. Um, but again, I think that's just because the stage of, of their training and the stage of their career is not so much, you know, Gen Z changing the way I think about things or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nick, have you seen anything? Have you have you watched, um, you know, going through training or maybe some you know real world stuff that you've been able to watch? Have you have you seen anything that these that these darn Gen Zs have done that you're just like, oh man, that they tackled a problem in a way that I would not. Yeah, do. Aaron. Um, thanks again, brother. Um, so here, here's the thing: is uh, you know, I'll go back to when I came in, and uh, you know, Justin kind of you know tapped on a little bit, but. You know, back in the day, it was it was come in and you know you said, Aaron, look at the mass and just stand by and wait to be told what to do. And um, you know, with this new generation coming in, they're they're coming in open to change. They're open minded, um, you know, innovators already. And uh, what I do like is they're not the you know from what I've seen at least here at the FTU, most of them are coming in and they're asking why are we doing this and that? Why why are we you know why do we have to train to that? Um, what is this new mission set? They want to, they want to understand what they're getting into and have the background of why it's so important, uh, to learn this new technology, to learn this new tactic, to go do these, you know, if you want to call it dumb things, uh, that they don't think is important. And then, you know, you know, understanding better why the, uh, the basic fundamentals are key to success moving forward. So I, I'm a big fan of, of this new generation and it's not a new, it's not a bad thing as they're asking, uh, questions. They're, they're challenging the status quo if, if they, you know, heard there was one. Um, and what's nice is, um, you know, I go, I'll go back and say it again. They're coming in a little more educated. When I came in, uh, like the rest of my peers, we all came in straight out of high school, you know, 17. I, I turned 18 at basic and then I went to tech school and, uh, you know, I didn't have that, that, um, you know, advanced learning, uh, background to go expel in, in the training environment. These guys are. And uh, they're finding better ways to uh, receive the data that they're given, right? When they're given an opportunity to go uh, excel and, and um, you know, um, get after a problem set, they're, you know, coming in already with, um, you know, COA 1, 2, and 3 instead of, uh, you know, getting a crayon and just figuring out one way of doing things. They're, they're already integrating uh, better as a team. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm not sure where they're getting that from. I don't know if it's just life experiences or they're a little bit more mature coming in. You know, it's not the, the standard 18 year old no more or, uh, you know, high school graduate. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of what I'm saying. You know, they're, they're open to change. They're asking questions. Uh, they want to know why we do uh, certain things and then uh, ready to move on to the next, uh, you know, task or problem set that they're given. So I, I'm a huge fan of it. And, and that, that's what I've been seeing, um, you know, at least from my perspective and the individuals that I do integrate with when it comes to the, the student side. Nice. So we're using this as the backstop, right? We covered the entire FTU, both phase one, phase two. And then, you know, this episode is really going to round it out nicely. And we're going to talk about all things FTU. But I, I did want to give you a chance. I know you guys have listened uh, to to one, phase one and two. Or did you guys get a chance to listen to that episode already? We did. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to open it up here. Like I want to, I want to give your shot. Like now that you listen to the phase one and phase two, you know, guys, I want you to talk about phase one. Like I'll give you guys each, each a shot here. And, and, you know, you've listened to the episode, you've already heard the advice. Would there be any advice that you would give anybody to be successful? Cause that's the whole idea behind this three part series, right? Is we want people to be <clears throat> successful at the FTU. We want to know mm-hmm. what problems are, are happening so we can avoid them. And then what behaviors are doing well so that we can continue to emulate them and, and then go on. So, specifically about phase one 
you know, if you had one or two little nuggets of joy for the, for the students, like, Hey, for phase one, I want you to focus on this and we'll do the same thing for phase two. And then, you know, finally, you know, the end um, of the FTU. So how do you, how do you feel about that phase one? What should they be thinking about JP? Uh, learning, right. Uh, the, I think one thing that maybe wasn't completely made clear is, is the different prior to phase one, uh, when a guy graduates basic training and, and all that, they're, they're still on Lackland. And they're at tech school, right? And you're you're a trainee. You're not a real person. You're just there, like right. trying to earn your beret, right? That's the three level course. Um, that is a different experience than what you're going to have as you go through the FTU. And I think the mass majority of the instructors, especially phase one, are are on the same page. Like you, when you get to phase one, you're already wearing your beret. Like you, you are a TAC B. We now are going to make you a useful TAC B. Uh, and so right. it is. There's a little bit more of a NCO and airman kind of relationship rather than, uh, you know, instructor and worthless cone that isn't a real person, right? Those are, that starts to change. Um, however, you know, still formal course, still absolutely instructor student, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there, there is a, there is a, a break in the way that the, it's approached. So when you get to phase one, you're, you're in the FTU, you're a three level TAC P, you got this cool little badge nobody cares about and a beret and, and you're, being upgraded, a lot of the skills that that they teach at five level or at phase one, um, they are what you were taught at tech school. It's just now a step further, right? Like you do shoot, move, communicate stuff at tech school. Then you get to phase one, and you're going to learn better versions of that, right? So you're you're advancing your skills and, and getting better at things. So um, I think phase, the key to phase one is is understanding that you're there to to learn. You're still in training. You're you're part of. <laughs> It's part of your your growth as a as a TAC P, uh, and not at no point have you made it right. Uh, I think that's the theme that everybody keeps bringing up. Chris said it, Lucky said it. Like you're you're there to train. You're not you're not there to go party in San Diego. You're not a free man. You haven't made it. Like you're there to learn and train right. and, and get better. I love it. Phase one, senior. What you got for phase two? What should the students really be focusing on? Phase two. Hey, Aaron. Let me let me just really quick go back to phase one, and I'll I'll, I'll transition over to phase two. Hey, so so phase one, what I what I want to um, just offer the, the audience. So number one is retain the skill sets that you learn in three level because it's going to pay dividends down the road, right? And number two is stay proficient with those skill sets. So Aaron, you're, you're tracking, man. You talk to Chris. You know, as soon as those guys at three level graduate, you know, they go straight to Airborne School. They go to uh, SEER training, survival training, and uh, sometimes that's like you know two month period, maybe longer. And what's not happening during that two month period is you're not uh, staying proficient at, at your, you know, shoot, move, communicate skills that you learn at three level. You don't you don't have the opportunity to do anything uh, close air support related. So what I would offer is, you know, stay proficient, stay in the books, uh, keep expanding your mind and, and posture yourself to be successful when you get to phase one and phase one. You know, the key to success is, you know, have confidence and trust your instructors at phase one, because what they're doing, like Justin said, is going to expand the three level skill set you have into the five skill level set, the journeyman, and get you postured for more advanced training to be more successful moving down the road. So you got four months of that, and then moving forward to phase two. And I'll, I'll start, you know, the phase two, you know, guidance, if, if you will, is stay proficient what you learn in phase one. Work together as a team. Um, you know, your, your whole mission in life when you're coming through the FTU, which is, you know, over a year of training, almost two years for some individuals, is training, is to, be, is to better yourself uh, the whole time, is to um, not only expand on, you know, what you're good at, but also fix the things that you're not good at. Every individual going through training is going to know and, and realize and get feedback of the things they're not good at. You'll make a mistake if you don't go and expand and, and try to perfect the things that you were terrible at in training at the at the previous phase because when you get to phase two you know it's 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 five weeks it's a uh, hard rush you know training you you get in the seat you get here to nellis and uh man you might get some orientation briefs some admin stuff maybe the first week called zero week and then it's moving right into uh learning how to drop bombs from the sky right and you know it goes back to five basic fundamentals you know what i'm hearing from our instructors here at, at strike phase is you know, keep it simple, you know, stay in the books and uh, memorize and understand and be ready to apply the, the 12 steps of cash execution. Uh, be familiar with your, your JFIR guide and, and learn TTPs. Um, you know, integrate and coordinate with the class that just graduated before you. 
and, and learn from their mistakes and understand better what, what, you know, what they did and what they did good and what they didn't do so well. So, you know, as you come to strike phase, you're, you're more successful. Um, uh, you know, be ready to, to uh, you know, talk clearly and concisely uh, to be better uh, critical thinkers. Uh, and the way to be a better critical thinker is, you know, doing the nerdy stuff that most of us don't want to do is get in the books and read and actually understand what's black and white. Because if you don't know how to do things uh, the right way, you know, you're definitely not going to do very well when you have to take the shortcut or, or abbreviate something and, and you know, uh, change your tactics. So critical thinking is huge. That, that's a big thing. I think uh, the whole DOD is asking individuals to do is, is get better at critical thinking. And the hard part is how do you train to that? And, you know, the only way to get better at critical thinking and thinking outside the box is actually going and, and falling on your face a little bit here and there and learning from those mistakes. And then uh, the key to that is coming back and fixing those mistakes, things that you failed at. And then what you want to do going forward, at least uh, in the FTU, is no instructor, no cadre wants uh, to, to talk uh, to students and talk about the same mistakes over and over, because then that kind of goes down that rabbit hole. of Maybe this isn't for you. What we love to do at, at, uh, at strike phase and, and phase one is talk about new mistakes, you know, because that tells us that you're progressing, that you're understanding, uh, you know, what was asked for you and you're, you're moving forward in a positive way. It's OK to, to you know, make mistakes and, and uh, fail things in training. You just don't want to fail the same things over and over because that, that just shows us maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you need to move on and do something else within the Air Force. Fantastic. Couldn't have said it better myself because I'm not as good as you. JP, how do you feel? Uh, f- phase two, what are they? What, what should you? Uh, w- what else do you have for the suits? What What should they be focused on? Yeah, it, it, so it continues with remember why you're there. It's the end of the. It is the end of the FTU. You're you're almost done. You're in Las Vegas. Uh, it is just right there <laughs> waiting to ruin your career. Right. So right. Uh, stay focused on the task at hand. It, phase two is hard. You don't have time to be screwing around anyway. Um, and then the other part of it is and not to. I guess it's kind of a trend with my answers here, but it, it's, it is the basic stuff. Um, every, every course loves to say that they're, you know, advanced this and, and graduate that. And it, it's plotting things on maps and doing what you're supposed to do. There's 12 steps. You do them in order. Like it, it's <laughs> getting away from that is when guys get in trouble. And that goes oh, to yeah. phase two. Yeah. It goes to weapon school. We, I mean, we would kick guys out of WIC and this is the highest level JTAC training air force. And it would be stuff like, they're not plotting things on their map. You know, it's not, you're not, no one's right. failing phase two because you were 30 seconds too slow. You're fa- failing phase two because you didn't take 30 seconds to plot where Bravo company is. You lost track of them and then you put them in danger with your crappy nine line. Like that, that basic stuff is a trend and everything that goes wrong, all, unfortunately, all the way to things like fratricide events. Like I start the course with kind of like an attention getter where I read an AAR about uh, a fratricide incident. And some of the things that go wrong are just like you would fail JTAC UC for doing this stuff. And here we are right. doing it in Afghanistan, getting people killed. Um, so yep. as as motivated as everybody is and, and as as much as everybody wants to say, like, this is super complicated and it's super important and we're going to push it here. And we're we're going to speed up here, whatever. Like, no, do the basic things. And if, as long as you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing the way you're supposed to be doing them, it doesn't matter if you're fighting China or Russia or the Taliban, or you're in phase two, or you're in weapons school, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Do it the way we showed you. And that's it. I mean, really. You had one chance to say that TAC P's were going to fight bugs on Clendathu, like in Starship Troopers. And you could have said <laughs> I Russia, really, China, you're right. Damn North it. Korea, <laughs> bugs it doesn't on matter. Clendathu. You could yeah. have said it. You don't, yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hey, matter. and if you are fighting well, giant bugs on an alien planet, plot your grids on a map and write a nine line and do 12 right. steps in order. It's, there right. you go. The damn, you won the war. Just do the <laughs> damn 12 steps. Like I asked yeah. you, I just, asked yeah. we wrote them down steps. for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I can't say thank you enough for coming on. We always end with the kind of words of wisdom or words of advice. And it's not just a tag P or, or, you know, a PJ, but really we, we talk to people that want to do something bigger than themselves. They just don't know what yet. Right. So let's say that you, you could talk directly to those people there. I don't know if you're aware, but there are tens of people that listen to this podcast. <laughs> like we're almost up into the hundreds now. So yeah. we got a pretty big Damn following um, of people, but JP, I'm going to start with you. What, what advice would you give to somebody that is coming into these career fields, right? It doesn't matter. PJ, TAC, PSR, Stowe, Crow, it doesn't matter. 
what piece of advice would you give to those people along this journey to, to help them out in some way? Yeah, you're, um, you need to take the, the weight of, of your decision seriously. Like you are, you are signing up to go get into gunfights and kill people. You are not signing up to go to cool guy schools or, uh, you're not going to pick your career field based on like what beret color you think is cooler. Uh, your tech P is not going to be your backup plan. Like if you you fail PJ because you're a bad dude, you're not coming to TACP. You're going to go watch jets for four years and get kicked out. Like, uh, you're joining serious career fields to do serious shit and you need to be ready to do that. And you need to remember why you're doing it. Uh, and that's going to apply for your entire career. Cause we talked about it, right? Like you're not going to have an Afghanistan date before you even graduate tech school. You're going to have years of, of who knows? We have no idea what's going to happen. And then one day it might be you on the back of a horse or riding an M1. Like it, you don't know, you have to stay ready for that stuff. And when that flag goes up, it's going to be to go kill people. So don't ever forget that. Like that's, what you're signing up to do and keeping that in the forefront of your mind will uh, help you get through training. Um, everybody has a, their little heart moment. I almost quit. Uh, I got turned around in the woods in Florida back when it was hard and uh, I couldn't figure out how to get out of this like thicket I was in. I really, I sat down on a tree and I felt sorry for myself and I really thought about quitting. And I had like that Hollywood moment where I was like, well, I might as well just give it a try. I took like two more steps and came out of the crap that I was stuck in. I was like, wow, I would have been that <laughs> idiot that they tell right. the stories, you know, I would have been the, the, the anecdote about what not to do. Um, yeah. So you're going to, that, that happens. You don't quit. Remember why you're doing it. What matters is getting the fighting on, not whatever else is people sign up for. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. 100%. Senior, I'm going to turn it over to you. Advice for somebody that's trying to do this impossible task in front of them. We call aspect war. Hey, Aaron, thank you. And, and first off, I'll say, man, it is not impossible. So here's, Here's three simple things that have helped me be successful. All right. The first thing is, is just being confident in myself, right? Believing in myself, believing in my instructors, believing in my teammates, my family, and, and then having confidence that this is something that I can do. And, and if you're coming, if you're choosing to come in aspect war, that's a big thing that makes uh, most, most of the people in it successful is just being confident in general, right? Believing in yourself. Number two is teamwork. Aaron, you know this, brother, is uh, there's nothing in the military that you can do alone, right? And training will, will, be, uh, will be assessed individually for certain things that we have to just do for training and during assessments or evaluations. Um, but we are never truly alone, right? We can, we can uh, study together. We can go out and do uh, movements together and patrols. We go out and fight together. Um, as you know this, and many people have heard this, is when you go out to the battlefield when you're in combat, you 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 have teammates to the left and right of you and and that's who you're fighting with and who you're fighting for right your brothers and sisters in arms right teamwork is key to success uh if you, if you want to come in the military in general and it's going to be more amped up if you come aspect or whatever community you choose teamwork is key and then the last one you know this Aaron brother man i've been in over 20 years brother and i'm still here is because i'm still having fun no matter no matter what environment you're in no matter what task you're given no matter, no matter what hardship comes along your way, you got to find a way to still have fun, right? Have that positive mental attitude. Um, be excited, you know, for what you're doing. You know this, brother. We, we've been in a while. We've been deployed. There's been tons of places you don't like being. You don't, you don't like being away from your family uh, during the holidays or friends. And then uh, for some reason, for some way, we always find a way to just have fun and, and make the best out of it, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and, and to me, those are the three things, at least for me, that help me be successful, that keep a smile on my face, that helps me wake up every day and just uh, continue to earn my beret, if you will. And um, man, um, you know, keep it simple in life. And, and I tell you right now, when you keep things simple and uh, you, you think that way, you'll be successful. All right. An opportunity will come your way. Man, that is a perfect place to end it. I just want to say thanks to y'all for coming on. It is <laughs> awesome to share at least some time. You know, we, we sat down, we talked for about an hour about TACP stuff. I love my TACP brothers. And it's great having you guys on here to talk some real talk to them. So JP, Senior, Nick, thank you for guys, uh, you guys coming on. Thanks for everything that you guys are doing out of the FTU to truly make every single one of these people that we're bringing through to include your son. Congratulations. <laughs> have no clue. It's, it's awesome to have a product out there. Senior, that's, that's dope. Thanks, brother. <laughs> um, but just thanks to everything that y'all are doing for the community. It's a, it's a big deal, and we can see the reflections of what you're doing. I 100% believe that you're putting out the best product because I'm lucky enough to watch those guys work every single day on the team up here at the 2-2 and through the larger
larger force with the you know the RQS and the attack he's getting out there. So, man, some feedback from the force. You guys are you guys are killing it. Keep your head down, JP. Keep that blood pressure low, brother. I know. Uh, I, I can feel I can feel the blood pressure coming through. That's that's what we DJs do. We're good for hugs and seeing more people. <laughs> I love it. Keep that intensity up, my friend. Um, to everybody else out there listening, thank you for following, liking, subscribing, doing what you do to keep us going. If you like the content, let us know. Put every question you got down in the comment section, and we will get back to you right away. That's kind of our thing. And uh, just get ready to continue training. We're going to uh, earn each breath and uh, train hard this week. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron.